What's the most idiotic rule you've ever been expected to abide by? I'll start. No Linux in high school because it was classified as a hacking tool. In 5th grade, my friend and I were walking through the mostly empty school to get to our bus at the end of the day. A teacher was walking in the opposite direction towards us, and yelled at us to walk in a line. So we made a line, just the two of us, and walked like that to our bus. But, a line can be drawn from any two points. You had already formed a line. I once took a part-time job from a temp agency at a Toys R Us distribution warehouse where my job was to cut open boxes, place it on all on a pallet and put the pallet in the bottom of the stacks, large shelves. We were all just extra people they needed for the extra Christmas workload. Met all kinds of interesting people including an elderly husband and wife who were farmers trying to make ends meet. Well anyway, the one person in charge of us was an absolute C. She was a permanent Toys R Us employee. We were treated like crap. Oftentimes we didn't have any boxes to cut open and were made to stand still at our tables. Large, but low metal tables with 4 people to stand around and do nothing. If we moved around or heaven forbid we sat down on the table, we were screamed at. I guess they thought if we were going to be paid for doing nothing, that we should suffer for it. Standing in one spot for up to 4 hours straight would absolutely kill my back. I have run into a lot of jobs where the rules seem to be just made to punish employees. Oftentimes because of what some bad employee did in the past and now all future employees have to pay for it. I worked at a Toys R Us store for Christmas as extra help stacking the empty shelves overnight. We had a rule that if there was nothing to do you'd go to the warehouse in the back and drive around like a maniac in those little electric toy cars. I don't think this was official policy though. I am an EMS helicopter pilot. I fly with night vision goggles. Problem. The FAA rules for using NVGs state that the aircraft must also be equipped with a working radar altimeter. So if I am flying over the Sierra Nevada mountains on a pitch black night and the radar altimeter fails, I have to take the night vision goggles off. Fixed wing pilot here. Your first job is ensuring the safe arrival of your aircraft. Screw the rules if you have to. Just land safely. I went to a semi-boarding high school, about 10% of students boarded, and new dorms were constructed while I was there. We had a big meeting, and the principal said no students of the opposite sex in your dorm room we don't want anyone having sex. A bit paraphrased. One of the students stood up and said what about the gay kids they get to have sex. So for about a month, the rule was no students of the opposite or same sex in your dorm room, with the exception of your roommate. One time at my high school, some kid got busted dealing pot from a bathroom near the auditorium. As a result, students were barred from using that bathroom for the rest of the semester. I'm sure that completely solved the problem. My high school closed a bathroom because someone got caught having sex in it. It lasted about two weeks before their two men elates caused by kids having to sprint across campus just to pee. Elementary school in Canada, we were not allowed to form circles. During recess and such as you get older, you kinda get into that whole oh look at me I am getting older and cooler and I just stand around and talk with people instead of freaking around in the snow type of thing. And apparently as forming circles are a safety hazard because supervising teachers couldn't see anything going on in the middle of the circle. I mean, god forbid, what if we were making a circle inside of that circle? You guys should have made a square to frick with them. At a previous job, I was instructed not to keep any document or email for longer than 6 months, and that my computer would be audited to ensure compliance. This included program source code. I was a programmer. Giving up my nail clippers at airport security. I fly the planes. Clearly, you're trying to take Conta. Wait what? As a lifeguard at a resort, I was not allowed to drink water in front of the guests, and ended up getting fired for it. Can't drink water in 100 plus. F. Weather. Pretty idiotic if you ask me. I am a system admin for a company that had a proposal to do some work for a large bank. They told us we needed to comply with their security procedures for data storage, and mentioned the name of the document in an email. When we asked for a copy of the document so we could make sure we were compliant, we were told that we couldn't see it as it was an internal bank document, and not allowed to be transmitted outside their network. That's also how US law works now. I worked at Pizza Hut for a while, 
We got an order for 5 pepperoni pizzas. So I laid out 5 discs of dough, stretched them all, then sourced them all. You know, the most efficient way to do it. The manager came over, and said I was doing it wrong. That I had to make each pizza start to finish, place it in the oven, then make the next one. I told him he was an idiot and kept doing it the efficient way. GM came in later and totally had my back. Christ that's a pathetic victory. I worked in daycare. We had classroom ratios. Say one teacher must be in the room for every five children there. My new boss wanted us to call her when we needed to go to the bathroom and wait for her to come and cover us for the time it took us to go pee. Okay, so this doesn't sound so bad. Except we'd call her and she'd tell us to hold it. Or she'd say that she was busy with something and would be there in a second. And then a half an hour later when we're slinking down the hall to the bathroom she'd yell at us for being in the hall. She also wrote me up for being too loud. In a daycare, I was singing songs to infants during circle time. And they were all sitting quietly and clapping. She was crazy. Didn't happen to me personally, but my sister is severely mentally and physically handicapped. Wheelchair bound and frequently has health issues or doctor's appointments, which inevitably led to many missed classes. Despite this we've gotten countless phone calls and messages on the machine informing us that my sister has earned an in-school suspension for her missed classes. Dang that's a good way to get your school sued. I wasn't allowed to watch PG-13 or higher movies, or the book, comic, game, act equivalent, until I moved out of my parents house at 19. Additionally, I was not allowed to have my computer in my room, not entirely unreasonable. The weird thing about that is it kept being true after I got married and was just visiting. See in that case what you say is okay, we're going to stay at a hotel then. Not me but I went to high school with a guy who had very overprotective, stereotypical Asian parents. He then went to college a 5 hour drive away from his folks, and lived at college, so when he was away, for all his parents knew he could have been doing drugs and going to strip clubs 5 nights a week, but when he came home for holidays, he had to be in before it got dark out, even when he was over 21, when Batman Begins came out, his parents only let him go see it with me and some friends because we lied, to him, for his own good and said my mom was driving us to the theater. We were all 21 plus. In schools, if someone tries to fight you and you don't want to, you can't even defend yourself. The rule is if you throw a punch, or perform any other violent act, you've consented to the fight. Are you a 140 pound freshman about to get killed by a senior? Did you hit them once in self defense, but got sent to the hospital? Well guess what kiddo, you've got 5 days out of school suspension. We actually have in our rule book the penalties for setting off a bomb, is that necessary? It was even worse at my high school, your butt was suspended even if you sat there and did nothing. I worked at a zoo and we weren't allowed to use the word evolution. In high school I left campus after class and got some ice cream. I came back 20 minutes later to meet with my teacher for help on calculus. When I walked into campus, I was stopped by one of the ladies on yard duty who informed me that I'm not allowed to come back on campus after leaving. I explained to her that I was coming back for tutoring but she didn't care. Long story short, she took me to the admin office and turned me in and they gave her weird looks and told her what I was doing was completely fine. Had to wear an aerial harness to climb a 6 feet ladder. When I was in primary school, about 7 or so, I remember that we were not permitted to eat mother nature lunch bars, because they promoted paganism. I ate them every day. Back in high school, our then dean of students, a woman who literally carried around a ruler to see if girls skirts were too short, tried to bring about a rule where girls had to have sleeve dresses at school dances. That rule didn't last long, as in before the next school dance, one of the female teachers, 35, told her that, after spending the weekend going to different stores, there was not a single sleeve dress that either she or a 16 year old would want to buy. Half the school would have been in detention if they hadn't taken out that rule. As a guy, I would have deeply considered purchasing and wearing a sleeveless dress to the dance, before chickening out and not going at all. The company I used to work at told us that our emails didn't work externally, and that we could only email each other. 
It was total rubbish, and everyone knew it, we could email our friends and families anytime, but we had to pretend like nobody actually knew. That's 200 people in the office hiding a secret because the IT guys weren't actually IT guys and had no idea how to set up an internal messaging system. The IT guys knew. They also thought it was a dumb rule and just let email through rather than block it and have to listen to users be. At a private school I went to, it was mandatory for all boys to wear ties on Wednesdays. If you didn't wear one you were sent to home to get one. Well, one day I forgot. Luckily, I was blessed with the ingenuity of MacGyver that day and made a tie out of a long piece of paper towel. It worked for a couple hours until some buttholes in my class pointed it out. Apparently, paper is not an acceptable material for ties. I was sent home. Once worked at a Chinese restaurant where if you forgot to put the rice on the table's order, white or brown rice which were free, the owner expected you to buy the entire table's meal out of your paycheck. It happened to me once in the 6 months I was there and they told me to pay the $50 tab for the table. I told them if they enforce that rule I'd walk out in the middle of service. They didn't enforce the rule. In my elementary school a few times a week they would take the brighter students and put them in a class 1 or 2 grade levels higher. To help teach maturity. I was finished my work. Grade 4. I was put into a grade 6 class. And didn't have anything to do. So I started doing the other class work. After I finished. I went to the teacher and asked if I had done it correctly. And proceeded to be chastised for the next 30 minutes. Apparently there's some taboo on challenging yourself. When I was in high school there was a rule that students were not allowed to grow facial hair in any form. If a student tried to grow facial hair or just plain didn't have the time to shave before getting to class, which started at 7am, he was sent to the disciplinary office, scolded by the vice principal, and forced to shave with a single bladed disposable razor and no shaving cream. Multiple of my friends faced this punishment. I asked several teachers why this rule was in effect, and most of them simply stated that they didn't know. I got one answer out of the dozen teachers I asked, and that was, it's so that the students don't look like they're older and get mistaken as faculty. This would allow them to roam the halls and not get sent back to class, to which I could only respond why don't you just learn what your co-workers look like the football coach was not happy with me after that. I was homeschooled through high school, and when I was applying to schools, I had this conversation with the local college's admissions folks. Admissions. Okay, and we'll need a copy of your high school transcript. Me. Oh, I don't have one. I was homeschooled. Admissions. Okay, we'll still need a transcript. Me. Right, but I don't actually have one. Admissions. Well, we need a transcript to let you in, so you'll have to send us one. Me, you realize that no such thing actually exists, so I'm going to have to make something up. Admissions, that's fine. So I did, and was promptly accepted. This will be a metaphor for life, take note. Not mine, but at my friend's work. Not allowed to download Firefox because it's not secure. Main browser was IE6. To show school support when the school song was played, students would link arms and sway side to side. We got a new principal who immediately banned swaying due to its suggestive nature. Any student caught swaying will be suspended. And we were. This was 1972. He was fired in 1973. In 2002, my oldest child had this weird substitute teacher in one of her high school classes. She commented about strange rules and his bad attitude. When she said his name, all I could do was laugh. It was my old principal. No holding hands or hugging rule in high school. In junior high during our school dances, whenever two people danced, their naughty parts had to be a basketball apart. Made for some real awkward looking slow dancing. We weren't allowed to talk, at lunch, in the cafeteria, grade 6-8. Year 7-11 in the academy I go to, but I'm in year 12 now so don't have to wear uniform. Have to wear thick black blazers year round and you're not allowed to take them off for any reason, except science experiments and art. In 09 there was a mini heat wave and we still weren't allowed to take off our blazers. Many detentions were given over that week for taking off the blazers so we wouldn't get too hot. My high school's cafeteria was too small to legally hold all of the students, fire code reasons. For this reason, I would eat lunch in the band room, 
My senior year, they cracked down on this. The principal called an assembly and announced that all students would be required to spend the lunch period in the cafeteria. At this point, I stood up and said do you realize that that would require exceeding the legal capacity of the cafeteria, breaking the law and putting students safety at risk the principal responded with well, sometimes you have to make do with what you have. I don't think fire marshals play that game. I install people's computers and remove old ones. Because it's a union building, I can't carry a flat panel monitor, 10 pounds, 90 feet down a hallway. We had the same sort issues when I worked at Kennedy Space Center. Couldn't move desks, computers, or any type of equipment. People of Reddit, what are some of the guy code and girl code unwritten rules that you always follow? Guy code, when greeting someone and you're not sure if they're a hugger, always shake their hand first. It allows them to throw up the other arm for a hug if they're down for it. If your friends help you move, you are expected to a. Uh, be packed already, and b. Provide pizza and beer. Mayo. I hate how many times I've showed up to help friends move and they have nothing packed and not enough boxes. What should take a couple hours turns into an all day marathon. As a guy that lifts weights and has brought some of his other male, and two female friends, into the fold, you never, ever, slander another person's weight on any lift. If your friend is 250 pounds and only benches 135, but is trying his butt off, then you never make a sound other than howling intense encouragement at them. The rule in my basement is, everything is heavy to somebody, as long as you're giving it your full butt, then the number is irrelevant. Exactly, brought a few friends into the gym to show them the ropes and they always, regardless of gender, mention being nervous weak but it's the journey, like I didn't start lifting the weight I did now, and I'm proud and supportive of anybody trying to make progress in any pursuit, but especially ones that I'm also into. The person who buys the shots, makes the toast, too many times I've seen someone buy a round of shots, and someone else jumps in with a toast, if you want to make a toast, buy a round. See something, compliment something. If you're a stranger, particularly if you're a guy, only compliment the things you wouldn't get slapped for touching. Hair clothing, great. Facial feature tattoo, maybe. But boobs, shut the frick up. Dude if there's like 8 open urinals don't take the one next to me. If I offer someone a beer or other alcoholic beverage and they turn it down, I never push it. Sometimes I don't want to drink and I hate being pressured. Never pressure a drink on someone. If someone offers to pay, you should ask them if they are sure. If they are, then it is rude to further reject what is supposed to be a kindness on their part. I got the bill. Are you sure? Yeah. Don't worry about it. Thank you. Or just thanks. Next one's on me. Don't have to reject or feel like you're taking advantage that way. Lightly picking on each other is a sign of endearment, but you should always be trying to build each other up. Don't put someone else down just to make yourself look feel better. Everyone wants to feel important and the center of attention sometimes. Don't bang someone that your friends are deeply invested in, even if it's not going to go anywhere. I wish I had friends who followed any of these. I will wingman any man. I don't even have to know you. Heck, I'll wingman any woman too. If you are trying to make an impression on someone you think you'll hit it off with, call me. I love love and I'm always willing to help make it happen. Terry loves love. If their bedroom door open, be careful to sound your approach before popping in. Never know what he's up to. That's why I always whip open doors, to catch people in the act. If somebody loans me money it's my job to remember to pay back, not theirs to collect. I lost a few friends this way. Girl code, if something is fixable within 5 minutes, makeup, something stuck in teeth, small things on appearance, you tell her and help her if needed, if it isn't fixable on the spot, you keep your mouth shut and especially don't point it out to others. I assume this doesn't apply to period stains. Those aren't usually fixable in 5 minutes but you can't let a person walk around like that either. If I hear a girl say she needs a hair tie I will immediately hand one over, even if I'll only have one left for myself. Treat your friend's girl as if she's a guy. If a guy needs a tampon, you give it to him, no questions asked. As a former rugby coach, I've seen so many busted noses fixed with a tampon.
still carry them all the time. Have your boys back in an altercation fight argument. I'm not saying 100% of the time step up for them. Sometimes people do dumb crap and deserve the consequences. But if the need arises, you should have their back. Even if it just means stepping up beside them to look intimidating. If you see another girl in an uncomfortable situation, you try to get her out of there or at least let her know that you got her back. I've done it for everyone. From my sister, to my friends to my friends moms. One time at a school event, my best friends mom somehow ended getting an unsolicited massage from another parent with boundary issues and I quickly made an excuse up that I needed help at the concession stand. No one is too old or too young to do this. On the more light-hearted side, in my experience, when you hug another girl, you always try to slot the boobs by going slightly to the side so that you don't just mash your chests together and hurt someone. I call the boob slotting thing Tetris. You can have the last beer. You can have the last slice of pizza. You can't have both. Female here. 1. If you see another girl crying in the bathroom of the bar club venue you're at, you ask what's wrong and try to help. 2. If you have a tampon or pad to spare and someone needs it, even if it's someone you hate, offer it to them. 3. If a girl looks distressed or uncomfortable with the guy who is hitting on her at the bar club venue you're at, she's now going to be a new member of your crew. This one is a little tricky, but it's usually pretty obvious when someone needs an out but can't manage it or is frozen or intimidated. If you see it happening, try to catch her eye because she'll be looking around. Once you make eye contact it's pretty easy to figure out if she needs an out, then swoop in and do the whole hey girl, where the crap have you been? We're all waiting over at the table for you and then you hook your elbow through hers and walk her back to your table of friends. 4. If you see you know that a friend's boyfriend fiance husband doing shady, skeezy crap, you tell that friend right away. If you sell a buddy a car, or anything of value cheaper than normal because they are a friend, that friend must offer to sell it back to you before offering it to the general public. My grandpa gave me a car and when my brother needed a car I gave it to him. When my sister needed a car he gave it to her. When it needed brakes and exhaust work she took it to the junkyard and kept the money. I'm still bitter. That car had enormous sentimental value. It was a 1990 Oldsmobile 98. It was so freaking cool. Ugh. When guys fight, we never hit the groin. It's against the Geneva Convention S. Thou shalt never hold a bro's wingman duties against him. When you're chatting up a girl, I don't care how unattractive the friend he's flirting with is, or how bad his flirting technique is, when he's distracting the air defenses to give you a clear run at the target, you do not insult his flying. You always review combat once everyone is safely on the ground. You absolutely never share a glass of milk with another man. This is odd. I've never seen such a foreign concept brought to my doorstep that I immediately agreed with. If you see a girl with her skirt tucked into her tights, tissue stuck to her shoe or lipstick on her teeth, tell her. This happened once in college when I was working retail. I was leaving the store's restroom and one of my co-workers, who was always a nasty bee to me for whatever reason, had tucked her skirt into her underwear. I debated whether or not to say anything and then went with my gut and alerted her of the situation. She was always super nice to me after that. Guy code if your drunk bro is about to cheat on his girlfriend, you must follow through with one intervention. If he says he doesn't care, you did your part and are free from any responsibility. Girl code when another girl asks how she looks, if you have something negative to point out do it gently and follow up with at least one or more positive. You gotta use the sandwich. Compliment. Insult. Compliment. At urinal. Dong in hand. Don't talk to me, man. Look straight ahead. Don't make eye contact. Never pick a urinal next to someone if you can help it. Farting is acceptable, but don't make a big deal about it. Last slice of pizza or last pop beer always goes to who paid for it. If you all chipped in, you don't have to ask, but you have to tell. And never take both in the same hangout. No matter what the earlier rules say, never mess with the music in another person's car. Don't care how crap you think their taste is. If you know someone else had a regrettable hookup, no you don't. Not even if you fall out and become enemies. You don't remember. 
The music and car thing is so true. I've driven long drives for people on terrible roads and paid for gas and no matter how much I pick my music to be inoffensive I get people reaching for the orcs. When I politely decline their music they get mad. More people should respect the orcs. Never steal a bro's large fry. Or the accidental curly fry. If another lady walks past and you notice a blood stain on the back of their pants skirt, tell them, but do it discreetly. Recently noticed a passenger had a spot on her pants, wrote her a note and slipped it to her as I was collecting trash from the carriage. Half hour later, I see her again and she has a different change of pants on. She was super thankful. The guy code rules for eating a banana. 1. Never make direct eye contact with another man while eating a banana. 2. Never close your eyes while biting the banana. 3. Never take a bite longer than 1 inches in length. 4. Never take more than 1 second to bite the banana. 5. Never let your lips touch the banana. Comma never let your lips touch the banana. When Squidward tries the Krabby Patty for the first time. In his home, you always call another man's dog a good boy. I only had one chance to exercise this girl code rule. But once I was passing a girl in the lobby of a building and she told me that she had just gotten a straight perm and was waiting for the rain to pass before she went outside so I'll let her share my umbrella for 4-5 blocks while we walk to a bus. Stop together. I would do that for any woman if it happened again. Perms are $200 plus. Can take up to 3 hours and are ruined if you get them wet within 48 hours of having the procedure done. I know this from watching Legally Blonde. If you are fighting. No matter what, don't touch the balls. Exceptions are made in a fight for your life situation. Bros before hoes, but not before wives. Sure it sucks when a buddy has to stay home for a weekend camping trip, but if his wife's sick and they have a 3 month old, it's probably best that he keeps his family's interests above your own haha. I'm from the south so some of mine are probably southern type of things. 1. Don't kill an animal unless you are going to eat it. 2. Unless he starts it, you must defend your friend in a fight regardless of the odds. If he started it, you intervene before he gets fricked up too bad, but only enough to extricate him from the situation. 3. If you go fishing and it's not your boat, you buy the beer, ice, and bait. 4. For close friends, show up to funerals, weddings, and birthdays, even if you don't want to. 5. Pay for the bachelor at his bachelor party. 6. If a friend is going through a bad breakup, it is the responsibility of the bro tribe to keep him out of the house as much as possible for the first few months. 7. If your friend is generally a hard working, industrious guy, and they hit a financial rough spot, and you can help, you help. 8. In the event of a hurricane, or other disaster, assemble the brass, grab the chainsaws, shovels, coolers and beer, and go house to house fixing crap. Don't wait for freaking FEMA. Do the crap yourself. 9. If a bro is in jail, and you can afford to post bail, then you post bail. 10. If a bro is stranded somewhere, you go get him, regardless of what time it is. 11. Don't let your bros drive drunk. Period. 12. If a bro seems genuinely down, ask them for a beer and ask them if they are okay. Sometimes they just want someone to listen and usually only a bro or their dad will listen or care. 13. If a bro wants to learn to hunt or fish, and you know how, teach them and don't talk too much crap about their ineptitude. Once they have learned a bit you can talk crap about how crappy of a shot they or how they always backlash the reals. 14. If you have a professional service that you provide, and your bro needs it, it's okay to do it for free the first time. 15. If a bro is working on his house or truck and needs help, and you know how to use tools, then help his butt out. 16. If you have a truck and bro needs to move something big, like a BBQ pit or a cornhole set, you loan him the truck or go with him. 17. If a bro is having a BBQ, you bring some kind of meat and beer. 18. Never touch another man's grill without his permission. 19. If you see your bro's girlfriend or wife getting harassed by a dude and your bro isn't there, you are the surrogate bro and must intervene. You are the surrogate bro this one is so true. Had this a few times with my mate's wife. This is going to sound weird as a guy code thing as it's actually a bro thing to do for women. If I happen to be walking somewhere at night, 
think grocery store parking lot, and I'm behind a woman. I always scuff my feet or something so that she doesn't get freaked out by a man popping out of nowhere. As a fast walker, I will usually also slow my pace so she doesn't think I'm trying to gain on her or anything. Women's lives are filled with these safety related mini panic attacks, and as a guy, I try to do my best to not cause them. I heard this dilemma discussed in an only plays video recently, and I'm more of the sentiment that if it's a long path, that is, just walking down a road at night with a girl ahead of you, you should walk straight past her, around, rather quickly, because those couple seconds of unease and slight panic are better than whole minutes of discomfort and paranoia. Be generous with your closest friends. Buy them an occasional beer or their favorite soft drink without keeping score of whose turn it is to pay. A buddy and I always run under the assumption that we owe each other some general amount of money. Not a dollar by dollar log, but just money. So if we need a bit of help buying food, we're just like hey, get this for me. Which perpetuates the I probably owe you something around this price mentality and keeps it going. What was the weirdest rule you had to follow in school? In elementary school we were not allowed to stand in circles because standing in circles leads to the gang life. Little did they know that us real thugs prefer gang banging in octagons. No high fives. In fact, no contact with one another whatsoever. This was in middle school. The staff was tired of watching kids groping each other, I imagine. No high fives. Groping. I must have been giving high fives wrong my whole life. We had a hallway only for 6th graders in middle school. It was really strange because it was in the middle of the entire school, but if any teachers found you there, you were sent to the principal's office. That reminds me of my middle school. It was 6th 8th grade, and the school was 3 floors. Top for 6th grades, middle for 8th graders, bottom for 7th. You had to stick to your level, besides the cafeteria and gym of course which were all on the middle floor. No same gender hugging. Really weird rule. Apparently some kid got sick, and their parent blamed same gender hugging. My high school went the other way. No on gay hugging. They were scared shitless to say anything to the known gay couples though. As a teacher, I had to make this rule. Underwear must be worn on Halloween. This was for college students. In my old primary school, their solution to every playground accident was to put a fence up. A child tripped on a tree root, put a fence around the tree, child slipped on some mulch in the garden, better set up a 6 foot high perimeter around the entire garden. Oh what's that? Someone pushed another student off of a bench high ledge? Let's put up spiked stockade style poles to prevent that from happening again. It got so out of hand with so many playground restrictions the parents started insisting the removal of most of them. Bonus. The children's name for the principal was Mr. Penn's son. In secondary school, high school, we were forced to leave the school in full uniform at the end of the school, meaning no jackets unless you were out of the main gates which are very far outdoors so if it was raining you were fricked. Thank god that rule only lasted 2 weeks. It always amazes me how little foresight rule makers have with things like dress code. In middle school we weren't allowed to clap during assemblies because the vice principal thought it was too disruptive. We could only do jazz hands. This seems like a rule that was made up just because it was secretly hilarious to watch a room full of teenagers do simultaneous jazz hands with deadpan face expressions. The 6 inch rule. We weren't allowed within 6 inches of another person. 1. We aren't American. We don't use inches. 2. How could you stop hundreds of students from being close proximity to each other? 3. You're making a rule for adolescent teenagers. Called the 6 inch rule. Hilarity ensues. It only takes one girl to stand a couple of inches from someone and when questioned say, but miss, he told me this was 6 inches. Forced to use a hair straightener for naturally curly hair in Japan, curly hair was not allowed. How dare you be the way that you are. No stomping on soda cans laying on their side and walking around with them attached to your shoes. Given how specific this is, I feel like it might be justified. No running in the schoolyard or playground during recess or lunch. How tf do you expect to stop 500 children from running while they're out there playing? They didn't allow the boys to have door on the bathroom stalls in high school. 
they let teachers use those bathrooms. Nothing like walking in on your 300 pounds history teacher dropping a deuce. The same rule was enacted in my high school for two weeks. It had to stop after a large group of boys would get together during class and wander from bathroom to bathroom finding people who were taking a poop and then yell, clap, cheer them on for pooping. Because of gang affiliations, we were banned from wearing three items of red or blue. Things got a bit hairy on school spirit days, where they encouraged us to wear our school colors, red, white and blue. Just turn spirit days into KKK rallies. Not really a rule, moreover if this isn't illegal, then it should be sort of think. Someone emptied all the soap in the boys bathroom onto the floor my freshman year, and the school retaliated by leaving the dispensers empty for the next 4 years. It was disgusting. Travel soap kept in my bag through high school. Way back in elementary school we weren't allowed to walk around the school in groups larger than 3 because it intimidated the primary grades like freaking what? I picture a bunch of 4th graders in jeans and leather jackets snapping while swaying side to side looking for some trouble. My school dates back to the 13th century so we had some archaic rules still floating around. My personal favorite was that the head boy gained the right to grow facial hair and graze his sheep on the headmaster's lawn. Whoa, that's pretty generous that the headmaster shares his lawn. I had severe kidney problems when I was in secondary school. The rule was that when we were in the yard, you couldn't leave the yard until break lunch was over. Like they literally locked the gates to stop you from leaving once in the yard. I had multiple arguments with teachers for not letting me go to the toilet, then getting bitched at in classes for asking to go or being late. In high school, skirts were to be no shorter than 12 inches off the floor. People wandered through the halls measuring. Bad for tall people good for short people. We had a lesson about how fire needed oxygen to continue burning. So, they said a fire would eventually go out if in a contained room with no extra oxygen. Our teacher then assigned a different student every other week to be in charge of making sure all the windows were closed before leaving if there was a fire. Thankfully, we never had an actual fire. No playing with kids in another division. Div, 1 was grades 1-3. Div, 2 was grades 4-6. Div, 3 was grades 7-9. People in Div, 3 and most of Div, 2 didn't pay attention to Div, 1, but when I was in grade 4, all my friends were in grade 2. Nobody was a jerk to a younger kid just because they were younger. Some of us had siblings in another division. I ignored the rule, since it wasn't enforced much. My high school started to do a school shooter drill twice a semester my senior year. They had a dude come in the front door during lunch blow an air horn and shout this is a shooter drill. Run. He had a water gun and would shoot kids with it and then tell them they had been killed. Me and my friends casually finished our lunch as he shot us then left out the kitchen side door to leave the building. Half the senior class ended up leaving as they had this guy go through half the school and through the freshman center over the course of half an hour. It was pretty ridiculous and happened several times, usually during lunch. This actually kinda sounds like fun. Imagine it breaking out into a whole water gunfight between the dude and the seniors. When I was in elementary school, we had a rule that kids were strictly not allowed to touch rocks. No rocks. Not pebbles. Not big rocks. No rocks. I got put in timeout a few times for touching rocks. The problem was, our playground was built on a pebble pit. If you fell or wanted to sit on the ground to play, you could very well be singled out and punished for touching rocks. It was a huge tattle fest too. Kids would catch others touching the rocks and run to tell the pay coaches who would immediately interrogate you. Did you touch rocks? Tell me the truth. I found a really cool rock in first grade and decided to show it to my coach. I told her it looked like an alligator skull. She smiled at me, took the rock, and chucked it as far as she could, then bitterly told me. Don't touch rocks. If you kept touching rocks, you'll be made to walk around the playground in circles sometimes until you had sufficiently learned your lesson. I once walked in circles with a few other kids until playground time was over. It felt like forever, but it was probably like 15 minutes. TL. DR. My school had a don't touch any rocks rule. This reads like some weird Ayn Rand and Dr. Seuss collaborative work. Like a dystopian society story in little golden book form. I dig it. I used to go to a K-12 charter school, 
and you weren't allowed to take left turns. Is your next class to your left? Nope sorry you have to walk right all the way down to the end of the hallway before you start back towards your next class. That whole school was backwards. Couldn't you just turn right and circle to you face the class door? No band shirts at my Christian school. But the only ones that would be recognized were Christian bands. So you could get away with almost anything else. Red hot chili peppers. A. That into cooking? Would love to see how a bad religion shirt got handled. When I was in high school the phrase epic fail was a thing. One of my teachers became sick of it and banned it. It was quickly replaced with catastrophic error. In 7th grade my Lang and Lit teacher tried to get us to stop saying shut up and somebody came up with an alternative. Be quiet with a passion. It quickly became a very popular thing to say. Couldn't dance, show our shoulders, or play games on school campus. School dances were sit down meals instead, as we were not allowed to dance. God is against dancing apparently. There was silent time in the lunchroom in Catholic elementary school at the beginning of lunch, ostensibly for prayers grace. I remember sneezing due to allergies and having to miss recess. Never forgave those freaking nuns. All the girls have to keep their hair short, which was nothing new in an Asian school. Strangest variation on the fact was that the dance club girls could all have long hair, but as soon as they finished their last dance competition, they are required to cut their hair short too. No hugging. All of the girls in elementary including myself would hug each other if we were friends. We would also hug certain teachers because some were really amazing people and helped out less fortunate students like me. We were only allowed to fist bump. Both the teachers and students did it anyway despite the principal monitoring the hallways all the time to try to stop it. Frick you, Ms. McRae. We had an assembly in middle school one time that was interrupted by a teacher. Apparently, a parent was there to pick up their child, who was currently sitting in the auditorium watching the assembly. The teacher grabbed the mic from the stage and said Dale Smith. I don't remember his last name. Will you please exit the auditorium? Nobody stepped forward. Nobody stood up. We soon all realized that Dale wasn't there. Before the staff could comprehend what was happening, the entire auditorium was yelling Dale's name, lifting up seats, and causing a ruckus looking for him. It lasted for a good 20 minutes. We never found Dale, and we never gave up. Every assembly we had at that school from that point forward started off by every single person in attendance shouting Dale's name and making sure he was there. Dale went from an unknown nerdy kid, to a king. Everyone knew Dale. Everyone had to make sure Dale was there. As a result of this, a No More Dale campaign began, and anyone who started looking for Dale during an assembly was punished. We had to ask to remove our jackets in class. Not overly weird but I went to a language school and in our French-German classes, we were only allowed to take our jackets off if we asked in that language. Kinda hard for a 11 year old who was still using Matilda to spell the word difficulty. Mrs. D. Mrs. I. Mrs. FFI. Mrs. C. Mrs. U. Mrs. LTY. That spells difficulty. How do I still remember this? I remember my school had an autism test once a year. As if someone could just suddenly develop autism over the course of a year or it could get any worse. In college, we had a professor who assigned seats. She claimed she did it to remember our names but she never remembered our names. I went to a private school ran by Seventh Day Adventists. From a religious context, the rule wasn't that dumb, but they banned students from bringing any food that isn't kosher for lunch. I got around that by bringing tofu bacon and pepperoni. High school. No backpacks. No leggings. Girls must only wear minimal makeup no lipstick. No colored hair, as if anyone listened. Nothing with a skull, weapon, or allusion to death may be worn. No plain colored shirts, shoes, bandanas, etc for fear of color gangs. God forbid the green gang gets us. Women must adhere to a strict dress code fingertip length garments no tank tops of any kind. No vests. No backless garments. No visible bra straps. If the edges of your bra could be detected from the outside of your shirt you got detention. No sweatpants or any kind of pant with an elastic waistband. Men may not sag pants. Sweatpants were permitted. No bandanas or do-rags. No physical contact of any kind. 
no hugs, hand holding, kisses, high fives, fist bumps, or anything including physical contact. Pants may not have more than 4 pockets. This goes for both genders. No chain wallets. No purses. No wandering the halls before school began. No cell phones may be permitted on the property at any time. Bringing a cell phone at all resulted in phone being taken and not returned to you or your parents. Phones were smashed or tossed into the pond. Ones in the lunchroom leaving the lunchroom at any time until lunch was over resulted in detention. This included no bathroom breaks. Middle school. All of the above but also had assigned seating in lunch. There were more but this is just what I remember off the top of my head. Our middle school picked a yearly motto to symbolize the spirit of the year. One year. It was just because you can. Doesn't mean you should. They translated it into Latin and everything and printed it on flyers all over the school. Not exactly a rule, but it was both weird and completely useless. It was entirely unclear what it meant to both staff and students. Was it in reference to grugs? Homework? Going into an AP versus regular class? Having physical intimacy? It was a beta reference to itself. In elementary school we had a stoplight in the cafeteria that was linked to a decibel meter. Allegedly. If it got too loud during lunch it would go from green to yellow to red. Red meant silence for a like 5 minutes. Any noise would cause you to miss recess. We had one too and if it went to red we had to be silent for like 5 minutes or something like that. It only lasted a few days because my friends and I would purposely sit under it and scream. The cafeteria ladies who had nothing to do with the light in the first place, ended up turning it off and it was never turned back on. Nobody likes a tattletale. Well nobody likes a bully either. I had a substitute teacher tell me this in first grade so I just had to sit at my desk in defeat with my pencil that the kid next to me broke. No putting clothes or food in lockers. No using lockers in the morning or between classes. No wearing glasses with frames thicker than 1 cm. You must wear black leather shoes and the soles must be thicker than 1.5 cm. Yes they really enforced this. Lunch was from 11.40 to 12.40. So you had to stay in the classroom for the first 20 minutes. Then you could either stay in the classroom or go to the playground for the next 20 minutes. But after 12.20 you must go down to the playground and must not eat in the classroom. Or else you'll get punished. The school was afraid of us falling down the corridor as the barriers aren't strong enough so they drew a line on the side of the corridor which you can't cross. Catholic girl school. Hong Kong. I could go on. I've told this story before. And 20 years after the fact I'm still not happy about this. In any case. When I started high school the entire school was open campus for lunch. That year, however, some of the sophomores were acting up off campus. So our principal, in his infinite wisdom decided that starting the next school year it would be open campus only for juniors and seniors. Think about this. The sophomores, who caused the trouble, who then became juniors and therefore this rule didn't apply to, weren't punished. But us freshmen, who became sophomores and weren't the ones causing the problems, were punished for what they did. So, I had open campus my freshman, junior, and senior years. It was closed my sophomore year. Still think that was unfair. In my middle school, students weren't allowed to wear any clothing with a logo, symbol, or image. And I have no idea why. No cracking your knuckles. For a while in elementary school, we couldn't run on the playground. The teachers were probably worried that the older kids would play over the younger kids. These see-through backpacks, tucked-in shirts, and stupid name badges that could only be worn with a clear lanyard because god forbid somebody show up to school with a raider's lanyard. My senior year of high school, the kids used to skip class by going to use the bathroom and never come back in hopes the teacher didn't notice they left. To try and stop this they made us sign a timeout log. Not that weird right? Well when that eventually did nothing to stop kids skipping, they started to make us carry around trackers to monitor our locations. They even would come and check on us if we were standing still anywhere outside of class for more than 5 minutes. Eventually the kids rejected big brother and just smashed them all at the same time. Cost too much to replace and they couldn't punish us all. What rules were created just because of you? Not me but my high school required that all valedictorians give a copy of their speech to the school board for approval. 
My class wrote a satirical one about how American prisons were a better option than going in debt for college and getting a job. School board hated it and told him to write a traditional one. He writes that she ceased. Most stereotypical speech he could think of. He was also an ESL student and his parents spoke an Arabic language. Don't remember specifically which one. At home. He gets up at graduation and reads the entire speech three times in Arabic. Now my brother tells me they say all speeches must be approved in the language they will be spoken in. I used to ride a unicycle around my school's gym all the time because while they specifically banned skateboards, bikes, roller skates, and even those heelys things, they never mentioned unicycles. They had to go through the whole official rule changing process to add unicycles to the rule book. Not me, but the intro to engineering class at UCF has a competition where groups must create a self-powered boat to race an orange around the circumference of the reflection pond. The pond is maybe 100 feet in diameter. One year one group used a lawnmower engine to power their boat, and the same year a group used bottle rockets. Upon starting the race, the lawnmower group's boat tipped over in the middle and poured gasoline into the pond. At the same time the other group lit their bottle rockets which promptly ignited the spilt gasoline and set the pond on fire. They created a new rule after that year. No gasoline powered boats. At some summer thing Texas A&M did to try and attract students, I didn't end up going there. There was little mini engineering contest where you had to construct a four wheel vehicle that would go the farthest, using an assortment of McGuiver ish materials, including a balloon, some tape, a mouse trap, paper clips, tacks, things like that, and like four Lego wheels and two axles. My group argued for a while, and honestly, we wouldn't have had anywhere near the best contraption if not for my last minute inspiration of rule loophole exploitation, which apparently I'm better at than actual engineering. No one said all four wheels couldn't be on the same axle, and there was no strict definition of vehicle. Four Lego wheels on one axle, flung by the mousetrap, 25 feet, beat second place by almost double, I think. Our team won TI-89s, each. That's not ruler breaking, that's just dang good engineering. My sister got a pair of toy earrings at the doctor's office, and promptly stuck them up her nose so deep that they were lost forever. After that, the doctor's office only gave out stickers. When I was in middle school, the dress code stated that every boy must wear a shirt with a collar. I decided to buy a really cheap collar shirt and cut the collar off and then wear t-shirts to school with it clipped on. Soon the school made one piece collar shirts mandatory. No marine in the company is allowed to perform marriage ceremonies for other marines. In high school, the student council was sponsoring a food drive to boost donations. Some teachers offered extra credit for every item a student brought in. Being the smart ass I am, I decided to buy $40 worth of ramen noodles at $0.12 a piece. That's about 300 packages. I did minimal work for the rest of the semester, and ended up with a 125% in the class. The principal was not pleased, and banned extra credit forever. That's why, at my high school, any teacher who offered extra credit like that had a cap. You could bring in as many tissue boxes canned items etc as you wanted, but you'd only get up to 10 extra credit points. My friends and I played a round of poker and lunch in high school. Naturally we didn't have much cash so we started betting things like the future virginity of the hot chicks and one stroke two of our soul. Fast forward to the guy who won one stroke two of the soul, he decided to put it on eBay. Two days later CNN did a piece on eBay selling intangible goods and they featured our .5 soul in the promo. The next day eBay announced that souls were no longer acceptable items. I remember that story. I was 14 at the time, 25 now. Back then I pirated movies via hotline. I decided to set up my own server. Access was not entirely free however. You had to go to my mock website, click on a banner for an adult revenue service, sign up, and on the final sign up page, look for these two words, which are the login and password. Each time someone did this, I got $20. I got a check from the company for about $400 before they caught on and banned removed my account. After that they changed their to so that a person had to be an active member for a month before they gave the referral the $20. My mom was very confused when I got a $400 check with dozens of P websites all over the envelope. 
After I explained, she thought it was amazing and hilarious and we cashed the check. A retail store I worked for changed the call in sick policy because I cut my foot and they made me come to work. The stitches split, and I left a blood trail wherever I went for a solid 5 minutes. Now, stitches are an acceptable reason not to come to work. When I was 7-9 years old my friend and I did nothing but play outside all day and build all sorts of wooden forts and tree houses. We got pretty handy with our tools and our projects got bigger and bigger. One day we found 4 good sized trees about 6 feet apart from each other in a rough square just a stone's throw from the neighborhood park. We decided to build the mother of all forts by making a platform in the middle of those trees about 6 feet off the ground. It had 2 feet. Walls around the sides and a sturdy ladder and eventually a second level above the first. This was a fairly small neighborhood and everyone knew everyone else so all the grown ups with kids came to check it out and after a few modifications it was deemed safe enough and for a few weeks all the neighborhood kids would play in and around it. We felt like kings. Then one day we came home from school and it was absolutely destroyed. Apparently the county somehow got wind of it and its proximity to the playground and sent some guys out with chainsaws to demolish it. We were heartbroken. They told our parents that from then on we weren't allowed to build anything anymore because the county could maybe be held liable in case someone got hurt. We gathered up our scraps, said frick the police, and moved further into the woods and out of sight and built an even better one and several backups just in case. In hindsight, I'm 30 now. I can understand why it needed to be done but all those years ago it seemed like the greatest tragedy ever. I've always wanted to build a tree house, but living in India makes it rather hard to do since none knows what a tree house is. In my high school we had a German language competition that was hosted at different hotels over the years. One of them had balconies for every room, and my friends and I discovered the wonder of hopping between them in order to get to someone's room. Because, you know, opening the door and walking was very difficult for us rowdy teenagers. Well, some of my friends decided to remove all the smaller furniture in one room thinking it was one of ours, it wasn't. Those people were not happy. Needless to say the hotel ended up posting a bunch of signs and the security waivers you have to sign for the competition added no jumping between balconies every year after. We were stupid kids. I don't consider it to be my fault, but I actually got D&D banned at my school, after some less than intelligent person saw one of our lunchtime games in the library and complained about satanism. I had to go through 3 weeks of counselor sessions, just because I made my voice deep and booming when I DM'd. My freshman year in college I lived in a dorm with a large courtyard in the center. We collectively had a large water balloon fight. One of the girls slipped and cut her arm open pretty deep and we had to call 9 one, one. The new rule my dorm made was no water balloon fights indoors. I go to a private school with a dress code, and because of me, chainmail is no longer an acceptable form of undershirt. At my old high school, now in uni, math class tests now start with the disclaimer all answers must be written in Arabic numerals. But they didn't say you have to give them in base 10. Time to answer in pencil. My story is not one of badassery but rather an example of thinking outside the box. In my high school physics class, we had fun doing the physics olympics after AP tests were done and our lesson plan was complete. One of the events was seeing how many paper clips you could remove from a bin using two AA batteries, copper wire, two nails, and tape. The logic was to make an electromagnet but after reading the rules and talking with the teacher, nowhere did it explicitly say that you had to make an electromagnet. I proceeded to make a shovel using the batteries as the handle, the nails as supports for the wire and tape bucket, and reinforced it all with tape. My group got the all time record for that event with around 1150 paper clips picked up in 30 seconds. We picked up over 900 more than the closest competitor. Needless to say, the rules explicitly state to make an electromagnet now but no one will touch my group's record. I play the tuba, I'm Mexican, and back in high school, my mostly Caucasian school was playing the mostly ethnic school on the other side of town. From where I resided, I was bused to the rich school on the better side of town. I and my other Mexican friend who played the trumpet, decided it would be a good idea to play the Mexican hat dance. 
Needless to say, we had many letters and parents to respond to. Rules have been changed on our district games on what's acceptable sportsmanship and pep band songs to be played. Not so much a rule, but my senior year of high school, I had completed the minimum requirements to graduate, but we were only allowed to have one free period. Instead of taking a class I didn't want to, I created my own Bulls Child Development class, where I volunteered at the preschool next door three days a week, and had the other two off. Seven years later, the class still exists, but has a legit curriculum associated with it now. I'm sure I am not the only reason, but when I was about 7 or so I was in the Miami and airport and back then the emergency stop button for escalators was at the bottom right by the entrance. I was young, saw a button and couldn't resist the urge to kick it while it was very packed. Well, it was full of senior citizens that kept telling each other to stand still because it could come back on at any second. That was that for about 15 minutes blocking the only entrance to the airport. Next year all the buttons had a plastic cover. With or without a life jacket, no one is to sleep in the hot tub. When I was in elementary school, I got a bunch of kids to wear shorts in the winter with me. I live in Canada. Most of us got mild frostbite on our legs. Now no one can wear shorts in the winter. First year of uni, my friend bought a sofa and armchair from eBay. 499p, Intel delivery, best purchase ever. He managed to fit both of them in his tiny room. Once the university found out, they didn't like it, so they told him to get rid of them. He said no. He managed to keep them till the end of the year. He put them in storage and the following September he brought them to his new, even smaller room. Only the sofa fit, so I got the armchair. Again, the university didn't like it. They sent us both very official letters giving us 30 days to remove the furniture. We printed off the entire residency agreement and read it page by page. Every word to see if there was anything forbidding us from having them. There wasn't. They had their fire tags. They didn't block any exits. The only possible problem was if it interfered with the cleaner's job. We asked her. She was fine with it. Our rooms were the last on the rotor, so she'd sometimes sit and talk with us after she was finished. Anyway, so after 30 days we got another letter saying that they knew we still had the furniture, and we would be fined. We printed off all the documentation we needed, suited up and went to the office to argue our case. After several months they managed to convince the cleaner to say the furniture interfered so we actually had to get rid of them. Our friend took them to his house. The following year we weren't in university halls anymore, but we checked the residency documentation on their website where we noticed the guidelines for furniture were now much more specific about what you could and couldn't have in your room. Four years later, he still has those sofas. I don't know for certain, but I feel pretty confident that I had the flow of traffic at a certain intersection in town changed. There was a very wide shoulder on the road that I used as a right turning lane, only to be immediately pulled over by a policeman for passing about 5 cars on the shoulder while they waited for the traffic signal. I counted the idea to him that the shoulder there actually was a lane. There was a dividing line and it was nicely paved. No reason for us not to use this space for making right turns, although no one used it. I really was passing traffic on the shoulder but being very cautious. About 3 months later, the intersection is repainted with the shoulder as a right turn only lane. It felt great seeing as it does help the traffic flow better at that crowded intersection. If you must bite the plaster in the art room, please at least have a justified reason for doing so. In case you're wondering, it tasted delicious. Sounds like a justified reason if I ever heard one. My German teacher banned us from say the mayonnaise in German because every question she would ask us that's what we would reply with. In German class, every answer, regardless of question freshman year, ich spiel gitter. Serious, what was a rule in your household growing up that was actually totally ridiculous? One of the foster homes I lived in had a rule where nobody was allowed in the house unless the adults were home. So sometimes I'd have to sit on the porch from the time school got out, around 2.30pm, until like 8pm when the foster parents got home from work, sometimes even later, even during winter. My stepmother had a similar rule which only applied to me. I wasn't allowed to be in the house if my father wasn't home. My brother and stepbrothers didn't have to follow any such rule. It really sucked during extreme weather. 
we were not allowed to talk during dinner. My dad just wanted to focus on eating. If you farted out loud, you were grounded to the bathroom until you could poop. I thought thus was pretty normal until a friend of mine was over and questioned it. My dad's big rule was don't bleed on the rug. It was obviously just a way to de-escalate the bangs and bumps of kids horsing around. He would hear a smash from the other room, then silence, then call out just don't bleed on the rug. One time my brother cut himself. He was pretty young, maybe 7 or 8. And my dad came in with wide eyes and said you bled on the rug bleeding brother didn't get the dad joke and thought his life was completely over. Started crying hysterically. Descalation backfired after years of build up. No drinks at the dinner table. My mum would make gigantic portions. That is. Four times the size of a regular meal and force us to eat every bite. We'd often feel sick afterwards which was great because that's when we had to do our chores. Later found out that she had an eating disorder and gave us quadruple portions so she didn't feel bad for eating a regular sized meal. Not our house, but in my grandma's house. No whistling. If you whistled, you were calling for the devil to come. Got to add a whistle to my shopping list along with nightshade, bat bones, and pencil lead. We were never allowed to be alone. We had to be in our parents eyeline at all times. And we weren't allowed to go to the bathroom without asking permission. Even when I was 18. Everyone had to go to bed when mom felt sleepy. And she often felt sleepy at 7pm. Also, no TV cartoons. My dad had the same rule that everyone had to go to bed before he did. He and I both have bad problems sleeping so I can see his point that he wouldn't want me running around making noise. No phone calls. Ever. We could not call anyone and no one could call us. Not even another kid's parent to say they would be late for couple or whatever. Phone calls from your boss at work? Nope. Work wants you to come early? No. You cannot talk to them. Don't call again. We weren't allowed to hang posters on the wall, even with the nice poster tack stuff that doesn't leave any marks. My parents were obsessed with preserving the resale value of the house. I had the girl room and my brother had the boy room. My room was painted pink, a color I never liked as a kid, even when I was very young, and my brother's was baseball themed. Brother could have framed baseball posters if my mom approved them. I was only allowed Monet's water lilies, also framed, because it was the only art my mom liked that went with the pink color theme. They've lived in that house for almost 30 years and have no intention of ever moving. How strict and often I would get grounded. Grounded at my house meant something different than what other people's grounded meant. When I got grounded I could do absolutely nothing. Wake up, got sit at the kitchen table, read a pre-chosen book all day that I had no interest in, go to bed. I was once grounded for 6 months because of a D. Also the insane amount of yard work I was made to do. Every weekend was yard work from morning until night. Then back to forced reading until bed. My brother once got grounded and he had to write out the whole bible. He left the house before he ever finished. Also I once got grounded because my stepmom thought I was worshipping satan because she found my Diablo II strategy guide. I then had to throw away all of my CDs in the book and game. Whenever my dad came home from work, my sister and I had to go in our rooms for the rest of the day, except for when we needed to use the bathroom or eat dinner, because my dad would need to relax and couldn't do that with his children around. Even just sitting on the couch reading a book or playing quietly with toys bothered him too much, and would make him yell at us to leave. Ah, childhood. We had to be quiet when we drove through Chicago because Oprah was filming there. I'm guessing it was because I was being too noisy or my parents were trying to concentrate on the directions. But I can't believe I bought into that for years. So you know how when you don't like the taste of something as a child you start gagging? Well my mom's rule was if you gagged and threw up, you had to eat the throw up. I'll never forget her shoving thrown up boiled brussels sprouts covered in stomach vial down my throat because I couldn't keep them down at dinner. Oh my god, this is sick. Your mom is sick. It wasn't the rule itself that was ridiculous. It was the fact that it was the only rule. Don't set the house on fire. That was it. I could do whatever the frick I wanted as long as the house wasn't a pile of ashes when my parents got home. Flood the sucker. For me, it was that Disney films were almost completely banned. I was allowed to watch Mickey Mouse, 
My mum felt that they were too saccharine and that I should not be lied to about the future. We actually all sat down as a family when I was about 5 to watch Mulan, then read the poem while my mum explained the differences. Jokes on her though, I watched Pocahontas at a sleepover, although this does mean that I have not seen The Lion King, Cinderella, etc. There were crazier ones but the rule of no eating after 4pm, as it might ruin our dinner was the most annoying. Unfortunately we didn't get home from school until after 4 so whatever paltry sum of food from the school cafeteria was going to have to be fine until 7pm. Because that's when dad liked to have dinner. I'd get headaches a lot when I was hungry so I usually had a headache most of the day. What's really funny is that each of us three kids had mentioned to our mother independently as adults that it was a crazy rule not getting to eat after school and she denied having such a strict enforcement to each of us. Adults usually forget the little things that scar us. Like how you forced your children to starve. Don't talk to dad and mom. I always thought that TV shows were making it up that there were parents who talked to their kids without yelling and cussing. They used to tell me there were no such families. It was all just TV. We weren't allowed to play video games during the school year so the NES NES N64 were nicely boxed and stored 9 months each year. However we could watch TV all day long without a problem. I can't play Mario but I can watch telenovelas. Awesome. When my older brother was growing up until he turned about 14, he was never allowed to own wear black t-shirts. That was probably when my mother was at her most super christian stage and thought that the color black was satanic. Of course she doesn't care anymore. She's honestly a wonderful mother and we all laugh about it now as adults. I was the only one in the house not allowed to wear black. I was really depressed at 13 and my parents said I could only wear happy colors. Looking back I understand why they did it, but I think my bro and sis should have had the same rule as well. But this was also the mother who chained the fridge shut when my sister was overweight instead of, you know, talking to her and helping. I had a 10pm bedtime from age 16 until I moved out. I turned 18 in July and moved out in August. The only exception was if I had work. I got grounded for a week because I was up reading. Five years later my then 13 year old sister came home falling down drunk around midnight. My mom was mad but my dad just laughed. No punishment. Being the oldest sucked sometimes. Everyone has to put an ornament on the tree or else the house will blow up. I love my father. When I started to go through puberty my mom wouldn't let me out of the car to go to school until I caked a lot of makeup on me. I was also very tomboyish, nothing wrong with that, and I also didn't like wearing makeup at the age of 12. Totally nothing wrong with that, many reasons why I was totally against it but if I didn't she would start having screaming fits at me in the parking lot and that would be really embarrassing so I usually didn't put up a fight. One day I went to the bathroom immediately after she dropped me off and washed all the makeup and went to sit in the gym where everyone waited for school to start. That's when I realized the degree of how messed up she made me look every day. A friend of mine immediately pointed out how great I look without and how I usually wear too much makeup. They never mentioned it before. I told them how my mom was making wear insane amounts of makeup and they didn't believe me. This is so strange to me because I was never allowed to wear any makeup at all when I lived at home. For religious reasons. I would sneak mascara to school and put it on. Then take it off before going home. I also wasn't allowed to wear my hair down. Had to be braided in a ponytail. Any jewelry. Or pants. Father gave my mother a cordless phone for Christmas. When using it, we had to sit next to the wall socket, not walk around, because its cordless advantages were her gift and her benefit only. That sounds like dad trolling. We weren't allowed to watch Spongebob because apparently Spongebob was the devil. My parents were ridiculously strict Catholics. I still don't see how they could think negatively about the charm striped sweater song and Gary the snail. We had to ask before we started playing with a new toy, and we didn't usually get to play with more than one type of toy at a time. For example, we couldn't play with Legus and Barbies at the same time. I wasn't allowed to bring my boyfriend upstairs when I was in high school, but I was allowed to bring him to our fully finished basement with a relatively soundproof door, including a bedroom. Maybe my parents figured we were going to frick anyways, so send us to the part of the house where they couldn't hear it. I got grounded one time, 
and my punishment was I had to wear v-neck shirts to school. I didn't understand why. I was about 10 years old, and my dad said, you'll see why, which I now understand to mean that his intent was for me to be ostracized by appearing gay. Jokes on him because 16 years later, v-necks are in and being gay is totally cool. There was a kid at my high school that always wore v-necks. He was totally straight but he rocked that look. I was always a bit jealous of his fashion sense. I wasn't allowed to trick or treat. I wasn't either, because of Satan. You can't have a friend spend the night because you're a lesbian and you la pay them and then their parents will sue me. My grandmother is a C. We weren't allowed to say what. I'm not joking. My mother would lash out if we said it. She was pretty weird. My mum had a book called Turmoil in the Toy Box written by this utter nutcase Christian guy who saw Satan in practically every toy of the 80s. So, not allowed to own troll dolls because there's no such thing as luck and wishing. Not allowed to watch or read the X-Men cartoons comics or watch TMNT because no such thing as mutants they're not of God. Was allowed to own Barbie dolls but not Cabbage Patch dolls or Care Bears. I don't even know why Barbie was okay but the others weren't. Rainbow Bright was bad because the rainbow should be reserved for the Noah's Ark story. Boy did she have her eyes opened when we accidentally stopped to watch Mardi Gras and Nick back in 1995. Not realizing what it was till topless ladies were walking right past us. She's fine now. She just grew up in a super religious family in a small town so she had some really weird ideas. She relaxed a ton as we got older but from ages 1-8ish for me. Those were the rules. But Not really a rule, but when I was about 10 we moved to some barn house in the backwoods of Maine. My parents had just divorced and my new stepmom was a real bee. She convinced my dad to put my bedroom into the attic so that she could have a computer room inside the actual house, where it was air-conditioned and heated, unlike the attic. And I'm not talking about some nice attic a book writer might use as their office. I'm talking like the attic from the movie Sinister. It was big with nothing in it but my bed and a lone dresser toy box. The attic had holes in the ceiling windows and cobwebs everywhere, which they didn't clean. Poor insulation so cold as heck in the winter. Also, before this I had been sharing a bunk bed with my sister so when I moved to the attic instead of buying me a new bed they got me a camping cot to sleep on. At that age I had trouble sleeping without a light on so I would turn on the only source of light in the attic. A hanging bulb with one of those pull switches. She find out and took the light bulb away. I wish I could make this up but sadly my imagination isn't that good. She was just really evil and had my dad totally wrapped around her finger because some might consider her decent looking. My parents were very strict about chocolate. What makes it seem ridiculous now is the amount of non-chocolate sweets we would eat that are just as bad for you as chocolate. But my parents didn't see it that way. One thing in particular that stands out is that if they got Dunkin' Donuts coffee in the morning we all got donuts. But no chocolate. As if a glazed or vanilla cream donut is somehow better for you. My mom made me take off my shirt to eat at the table until I was like 14. I am a girl. We had to say grace before each meal. I found out later on that my parents were both atheists. Does that make any freaking sense? Washing your hands in the kitchen sink was a cardinal sin. Hand washing should happen in the bathroom, only. I still can't figure that one out. My dad said this one all the time but no one ever honored that rule. Today, even he washes his hands in the kitchen sink now. Single male child, and I was never allowed to have the door to my bedroom closed, day or night. Frick that for so many reasons. Had to go to bed at 8pm until I was 16. No exceptions. After 16 I had to be in bed, but I could stay up and watch TV. Just couldn't leave my room. It was so my dad could smoke pot and not be caught. I had to take my pills. I'll explain. My mother took me to doctors starting at about age 6 and told them I had symptoms I didn't have. Things like acting out, not being able to focus, etc. I'll cut it way short but I will say it escalated quite a bit and by the time I was 18 I took 22 pills each day and had more than a handful of psychiatric hospital visits under my belt. Moved in with my dad when I was 18 and immediately stopped taking the pills. I'm a normal, functioning guy with no mental illness. Seems hard to believe it was so long ago, but I kinda regard coming off the pills as the start of my life, 
and I don't remember much before then, haven't spoken with my mother since, and have no contact with my siblings. It's kinda sad but I'm quite literally not the person they grew up with. We were only allowed to shower bathe every other day at the most. According to my husband and his siblings, they were only allotted one shower a week growing up. He used to get up in the middle of the night and sneak showers. He also grew up to be a major obsessive clean freak. The remaining siblings are all dirt balls. No noise while eating dinner. If our fork or knife scraped the plate, or our spoon clanked on the bowl, they took it away. Eating peas or soup was especially rough. No eating after 9, even if you were starving or sick. We would sneak up at night and wait for our parents to fall asleep and try to eat then but if we got caught they took everything that didn't require cooking into their bedroom and we never saw it again. Can't be on the phone longer than 5 minutes or they would unplug the cord from the wall. Also, we had to use the phone into the same room with our parents present. No alone time on the phone. Of not being allowed to make a mess with the wrapping paper on presents or rip it too much or else we got yelled at. Open it from the corners. There is no need to tear it one present at a time. One person at a time. Took over two hours to open gifts at Christmas. We had to find some place to go every single weekend. We were not allowed to be at home because it was my parents break time. We spent a lot of time at our grandparents and at friends. If we stayed at home and couldn't find anywhere to go, or were sick home from school even, we had to spend the entire day, s, in our room and were only allowed out for bathroom and meals. We couldn't walk around in our nightgowns or pajama pants, neither me, my sister or my brother, because it was inappropriate and indecent. In the summer, we would even get in trouble for sleeping in our rooms when it was like 90 degrees in our underwear. Like, in our own bed only. No hall light on or night lights of any kind. Even as young children, my stepfather was the only one allowed in the recliner and if my mom was sitting on the couch, the kids had to sit on the floor and give her the entire thing to herself. Absolutely no talking in the car. Period. Like, even on 6 hours car rides. Not even to ask a question. No noise whatsoever. No laughing. Like ever. If my siblings or even my mother were caught laughing by my stepdad, he told us to knock it off and stop acting up. If we kept it up we got sent to our rooms. We were not allowed to eat any of my stepdad's junk food or cereal. He would flip crap if we even had say, one out of an entire box of Twinkies. Yet he never bought us any, and would purposely bait us to get in trouble by leaving a box of them on the table or counter for weeks and counted them every time he came home from work. Only one box of cereal was allowed open at any given time. My stepdad would inspect the cereal boxes daily and if more than two were open he would take the second one into his room and we would never see it again. At my grandmother's house, if a bottle of alcohol was opened it was to be finished. It's apparently a Russian thing. Children of strict parents, what was is the most ridiculous rule your parents gave you? My dad was very strict. One of my close friends had an older brother and one had an older sister, both of whom had cars and driver's licenses. So it was no uncommon for us to ask one of the older kids to drive us somewhere, the mall, a park, etc. I had several conversations with my dad that went like this. Me. Hey dad, me and the guys are going to the mall. Joe's brother is gonna drive us. Dad, when? Me. In like 30 minutes. He's gonna drop us off at the mall and go to his basketball practice and then he'll pick us back up on the way home from basketball practice. Dad, when is basketball practice over? Me. He said it's done at 4.30 and he'll pick us up at 5. So we should be home by 5.30 at the latest. Dad, I want you home by 4.30. Me. Um. Dad that doesn't make any sense. I just said. Dad, interrupts. If you're not home by 4.30 then I'm calling the police. Me calls friends. I can't go with you guys to the mall. I bought my first car with my own money at 17, and I wasn't allowed to drive it to school, or work, or anywhere even though I had had my driver's license for a full year prior. My mom would drive me, in my own car places. It was pretty embarrassing and absolutely stupid. She had no rights over your car if it's in your name. My parents read an article in some stupid magazine that you cannot sit in front of the computer for longer than 45 minutes. So they set a rule that I cannot use the computer every hour from, say, 7.45 to 8 o'clock. Every hour, 
Even if I turned it on at 7.35, I still had to leave the room, so they know I am not using the computer. At 7.45. Holy crap. How did I survive? I had no privacy. My parents read through my phone whenever they wanted, which is acceptable to a point I guess. They were paying for it, looked through my laptop, and even went through my drawers and read any journal or diary that I had. If I got in any trouble they took my bedroom door. I didn't have a bedroom door from the time I was 15 until I moved out at 18. I didn't have a bedroom door from the time I was 15 until I moved out at 18. That's a lot of trouble. Not being allowed to wear tie-dye mooty colored clothes because it was representing the gays. Hit me with that gay crap. All children of strict parents know this. You should socialize more. You are always in your room on your computer. Can I go out with friends then? No. Definitely this. My mom is exactly that. I wasn't allowed to cross the street without an adult until I was 15. If I was going to hang out with friends, my mom would call their parents to make sure that we wouldn't be walking anywhere, so that I wouldn't be crossing streets. At the time I thought it was weird but cute that she worried for me so much. Now it's just incomprehensible to me. Curfew at 4 in high school, but also they wanted me to join all the clubs, which ended at 4. Got grounded a lot. Sounds like entrapment. If I said a word too much, and it started to annoy my mom she would consider it a curse word. If I said it, I'd be punished as if I'd said one too. I remember I picked up the word nasty from watch that so raven. Particularly hard to not say that one. We were not allowed to speak in the car, at the dinner table, or anywhere near her really. I wasn't allowed to swallow too loud, but because I couldn't learn how to not swallow without sound I just never drank around her. 80s and school projects were not allowed. She never praised me only told me I could do better. Comma I remember crying when I got to high 80 in my world history class in 8th grade. It had been the highest in the class. But what really takes the cake for this one is in elementary school. I was up for getting an award at school. But the longer the award ceremony went on the more irritated I saw my mom get. I remember thinking I was going to get into so much trouble because she was here. But I wasn't getting an award. I was so relieved when I was finally called up that I didn't even care that I got the freaking gold presidential award. I have a lot more stories like this. My mom really messed me up. Oh my gosh. To be anxious and afraid of getting in trouble when you're getting a prestigious award. Jeez I'm sorry. We were allowed to have diaries, but we had to let our parents read them if they asked. As a result, we did not keep diaries, because they would always ask to read them. I kept a false diary full of boring crap. They also have a very selective view of privacy. Locking doors meant we were up to no good, and they would routinely barge into us in places like the bathroom. When we told them to get out, they could not understand why we were upset. FTR. Mine and my sister's bathroom does not have a lock on it. They also would selectively enforce the rules. Telling was when they were doing something bad or malicious. Tattling was when you told to get them in trouble. Naturally, my sister would do something mean to me, i.e., made an opening night play with very mean things being said about me. And when I told them, I got in trouble for tattling. But when I wrote in my diary the mean things my sister said, she read it and told, it was telling because writing those things is very mean, crazy. Whoa, man, that's abuse, kinda. My boyfriend's parents didn't allow us to be alone together in a house for a couple years into our relationship. We were adults and they had this rule. However, we were both away from college so they didn't have full control. So what did they do? They tracked my boyfriend's phone at night and thus they'd catch him for spending the night at my dorm. That didn't go over too well. So he started leaving his phone at his dorm at night. Although not the strictest rule by far, the one that affected me the most socially was not being allowed a TV or media until 16 stroke 17, and even then it was very basic cable and Disney channel. I was fascinated by Good Luck Charlie at 18 because it was the first show I'd ever watched. This really affected my relationships and it estranged me from the other kids. At 23 I'm still learning about basic A-list celebrities and movies like Godfather and Titanic. The entire entertainment industry feels like Pandora's box. Probably not that strict but my mum would never let me have those candy stick things because they encourage smoking. If anything seeing her go into the back garden for a cigarette a couple of times a day encouraged me to smoke. 
not some sugar stick. Also, if anyone's from the UK and remembers the children's TV program Tracy Beaker, I wasn't allowed to watch that because it was a bad image of what foster homes were really like, yeah IDK either. No going outside unless given permission. For my own yard. No eating anything unless given permission. No watching WWE because it does not depict real wrestling. No cutting hair above chin because it looks gay. No dyeing hair unnatural colors because it looks gay. For me specifically, no dyeing hair at all because I have red hair and your hair is rare so don't ruin it. Of all the reasons a parent would tell you not to watch WWE, not being true to the athletic competition of wrestling is a strange one. She didn't let me hang out or associate with anyone who I went to school with. Only people from church who I didn't get along with. My mom once yelled at me in the car, in front of my friends, for not wanting to use a blanket when I slept at night. It was summer. She said I had to because it was her job as a mother to raise me to be civilized. That doesn't actually make you civilized. You're just going undercover. I don't remember what I did, but I had to look at my opened Christmas presents for 6 months and wasn't allowed to actually open their packaging. We weren't allowed to watch any new cartoons because they had a vulgar art style because it would supposedly corrupt our brains. I don't know too many examples because I couldn't really watch them. Also any show with a couple dating or anybody having a boyfriend or girlfriend was a no no probably so we didn't get the idea to wanna date someone at school. We were basically stuck watching Nick Jr. The old Hanna Barbara cartoons on Boomerang. Rip, and a few Disney sitcoms like Good Luck Charlie. No Pokemon because it teaches evolution and because the Pokemon are supposed to be metaphorical demons. The same went for Skylanders. Oh, you have money, you wanna buy something? Well, you can't, because it's like 5 months before Christmas and you'll be getting stuff then. Wouldn't wanna spoil those presents, do you? My parents locked the fridge with a chain. I was not allowed to ask for a certain present. My parents decided what I received for Christmas Easter birthday. You know how you are supposed to write a letter to Santa or the Easter bunny or whatever with whatever toy, book, sweet CTC you would really like to get? I wasn't allowed to do those. My parents forbid me to ask for anything because they know better what I need so I should be grateful for whatever gift they thought was good for me. It was usually clothes, school stuff, sweets and a few cheap toys. One time we had to write Santa a letter as an assignment in class and the teacher promised us she'll pass it on to Santa. I was really excited because I thought I could cheat my parents and tell Santa what I really wanted to get. I asked for some stupid game that was really popular back then, a Barbie and a lot of chocolate. Turns out that the teacher gave the cards to our parents. Christmas morning I woke up to find absolutely nothing under the tree. I spent all morning, until my parents woke up. Searching for my present until they said that greedy children don't receive any gifts. I haven't asked for crap since then. I'd rather receive clothes and books than nothing at all. Your parents are buttholes and don't deserve any relationship with you. We had a paid trip to Disneyland with a band but we weren't allowed to go because Disney supports homosexuality. We cold drink out of bottles with a spigot thing coming out of the bottle because it could set us up for later. I couldn't go to the football dinners every Thursday before the game because there were girls there. I invited a girl to church and was told to make up an excuse why we couldn't get her. The idea was that I would be thinking about the girl more than God. We weren't allowed to have sugar because apparently we went brain dead after we ate it. Girls couldn't bring in wood for the wood stove because it could hurt their baby makers. Can't go to Disneyland because anti-gay. But god forbid you go someplace where girls are present. Fasipum. Spanking was an acceptable punishment until I left for college. I'm 26 and my mom has threatened to spank me a couple times in the last year. No pants allowed. Good girls only wear dresses or skirts. I wasn't allowed to go to the bathroom by myself till I was teenagers. I wasn't allowed to talk to boys my age. But our creepy pastor could have as much one on one time with me as he wanted because Jesus. That is creepy. I wasn't allowed to use the word hate. Imagine the peril when I had to spell it in kindergarten. Same. I was left yelling. I strongly dislike you. At my brother. My father had a strict rule of no girlfriends until you're 18. Annoying because I was a teen. Like, I was still going to go like people and his barely present self wasn't going to stop me. Dunno what his problem was with that. 
Jokes on him. Get a boyfriend instead. Improvise. Adapt. Overcome. A friend of mine wasn't allowed to see Are We There Yet at the movies with us because it was rated PG. We were 12. As a 17 year old, I wasn't allowed to have anyone besides them in the car with me. I'm not sure what they thought that would accomplish, but I broke the heck out of that rule. My mom took away my cell phone and house keys throughout all of high school with the logic that since I didn't have a means of communication I would come home straight after school. Instead I would either have to wait at my friend's house for like 3 hours till they came home and they would freak out when they found out I was at a friend's place. I wasn't allowed to sit on my bed. It would crease the covers. I was supposed to make my friend sit on the mattress after I'd pull the covers back. But kids are dirty so I just let them crease my covers and took the aftermath of shouting after they'd left. My late stepmom wouldn't allow me to sit on my bed either. I would sit on the floor to do homework. To be fair, the comforter was custom made and very expensive. Not allowed to go trick or treating. Never went trick or treating in my whole life. Yup, same. Halloween was evil. Fart was a swear. Watching some film with my parents in the living room, my mom held potato chips over my eyes to stop me from seeing boobies. I was 13. I was also not interested. My then father physically pushed me around because I left wet cutlery to dry next to the sink instead of drying it with a towel. Later on he started labeling the milk cartons in the fridge to enforce a quota system. I was paid one whole shiny Canadian dollar. That's loony. There was a rule where I had to get up 2 hours before school. It only took me all of 10 minutes to get ready, and then another 10 to walk to school. This rule ended getting me kicked out of my house. My stepmom came in to wake me up. I said I wanted to sleep a little longer. She went and told my dad that I was refusing to go to school and that I was being disrespectful. Dad came in with a belt, beat my butt awake, threw me outside middle of a midwestern winter and told me to walk to school i had on a sports bra shorts no shoes or backpack i didn't even have my glasses so i called off for a minute and knocked on the door to see if i could get ready for real now we got into a heated argument after he wouldn't let me in and i ended up getting choked out on my front lawn i had to bite the ever living frick out of his shoulder to get him off my dad was an abusive butthole and the public school did not give a frick I had gone to the cops before with bruises, a fat lip from stepmom breaking a hairbrush on my face, etc. Nothing ever happened. I had a black eye, bruises around my neck, and scratched from the branches on the ground from when I was being choked. I went to the resource officer again, and they went to my dad's house and he claimed I attacked him, and they believed him for whatever freaking reason. Probably less paperwork for them. I was kicked out of the house when I got home. I was 16ish and on my own. Thank freaking god. Not me but I had a friend whose dad was so strict, and any time a child broke a rule one thing or theirs would get broken or thrown away. My friend, high schooler 17 at the time, had a laptop he bought with his own money. He was past curfew one night and his dad broke his laptop with a hammer. I still feel sad about it to this day. I hate parents like that. I had a friend whose dad made us come pick him up if he was to stay at a friend's house for the night despite him being able to drive at 16. Once he turned 18 even though he didn't legally have a curfew, his car had a curfew so again we had to follow him home so he could drop off his car. Kind of annoying. Married couples. What is the unspoken rules of a successful marriage? Respectfulness is often more important than the old saying about communication, respecting your partner, being mindful of things they're doing, etc. Learn when your partner is focused on something, and avoid interrupting them, etc. Respect each other's need for free time away from each other. Respect your partner enough to not trash the house, or force your partner to do all the household chores. I agree with this, I'm pretty terrible at communication, we both know this. What I won't do is blame him for my lack of clarity. I won't let things boil over to the point where I would say mean things to him because I respect him and our relationship too much. We are a team in this life. Sometimes you're wrong and sometimes they're wrong. Don't keep score, and don't use well last time, as an excuse to keep going when you're the one who is wrong. Also, talk things through. Can't stress this enough. 
Not married but this is one of the bigger reasons my last relationship didn't work out. I've tried to talk things out but it could only get so far. Don't keep score. Forgive and forget or if anything move the frick on. Love your partner the way they need to be loved, not the way you need to be loved. Everybody always says to be honest and to communicate with each other. The extra step that is left out is to not punish your spouse for being honest. Sometimes you might hear things you don't like. But if you punish this honesty, the communication line will close. There's no winning an argument when you're married. You either come to an agreement somehow or you've both lost. A situation where one person walks away feeling discouraged, unheard, and disrespected is not a victory when you're married. Yep. When I go to a shower and they ask for advice for the newlyweds, mine is always don't forget you are both on the same team. If you are fighting against each other instead of working towards the goal, it goes bad really fast. The worst time in my marriage is when we stopped rooting for each other and forgot that we were supposed to work together. And it almost ended us. Sometimes you'll be helping each other poop or puke or both and cleaning it up. Don't ever bring this back up to humiliate the other. My wife is pregnant and kind of, emotional. We have an agreement that I can't laugh at her farts unless she laughs first. This is going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. I'm a divorce attorney and I've been married for almost 20 years. Here's the secret. Be the kind of spouse that you would like to have by your side. Forgive the things you would like to be forgiven for and fight for the things that you would like someone to fight for on your behalf. The best way to have a good spouse is to be one. Well put. Don't correct the other person unless it's important, otherwise it'll just raise the level of irritation. More generally, pick your battles. Yup, my wife misspeaks all the time. Tonight she asked me to put ice on the front step. I know she meant salt. What good would pointing it out make? I realize you're talking about bigger things, but if it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I'm not married but my dad once told me to never make a big purchase without taking to your spouse about it and to never hold money against each other. My friend told me it's two blankets on the bed, one for each of you. No matter what happens, we're on the same side and working towards the same goals. From work to family members, the rest of the world can be a but, but at the end of the day, we chose each other and we remember why. Making all the rules spoken. And spoken rules are basically landmines. Agreed. Nothing ruins a, nigh, relationship faster than taking something for granted which never has been communicated. If one person voluntarily cleans something the other person is expected to not complain about how the job was done. They might not load the dishwasher the way you do, but they did load it. That is a win. It sounds trite, but honest communication. Never disrespect your partner, not in public, or in conversations to your friends, or in front of the kids, etc. Friend of my brother does this, she is such a nice, educated, and successful woman. He always berates her and puts her down in front of others. It is so sad to treat your so like that, really makes me want to say something but I know it's just going to make it more awkward for everyone especially her, so ugly of a person to do that. If your so drops the pot of dinner on the floor, or the garbage bag bursts and makes a mess, you step in and say go sit down and watch TV. I will clean this there is nothing more frustrating than making the effort to keep your family clean and fed, and having to fight against the universe at the same time. If your so has your back at exactly that moment, it's instant love. If your partner is in a bad mood, leave him her alone for a while. Why people pick at someone who's in a bad mood is beyond me. Cause the same person later says that you didn't care last time he she were in bad mood. 50-50 doesn't exist. In fact it's harmful. What you're looking for is 60-40. Sometimes you get 60. Sometimes you get 40. Remember that the last words you have spoken to her may be the last words she ever hears from you. Beautiful advice. Poofling a monkey. One rule I've followed for the last decade is that I never ignore calls from my wife. If she's calling or texting me, I answer no matter what. If you're going to buy one piece of really expensive, nice furniture, get a quality bed with the best mattress. You're going to spend up to one stroke three of your life in this spot with this person. No need to pee each other off because you're sleeping in a bad bed. 
have separate interests and also shared interests. And friends. Never use the D word, divorce. Assume it's not an option. Assume it's never an option. Every fight you work through the best you can. You won't always agree, but at the end of the day, neither of you is going anywhere. It allows you to be vulnerable and honest about things without worrying your spouse will dip out on you depending on what you say. I'm not saying divorce is never the option. I truly believe being cheated on and similar issues are hard, not impossible, but incredibly difficult to work through. But once trust is gone, it can be irreparable. But if you live life assuming divorce is off the table, and focus on trying to strengthen your relationship in the difficult times, it will change your marriage drastically. Absolutely, we even have a no joking about divorce rule. It's not a light thing, and no laughing matter. Love is a decision. Some days that decision is harder than others. Some days they carry you. Some days you carry them. It should balance out eventually but the time scale is yours. Do something together so you have something to talk about. It's okay to do things apart too important even. My husband loves art films. I don't he goes without me. I love running. He doesn't I go without him. You still get to be an individual. You don't have to do everything together. Don't expect the other person to deeply change. Learn to compromise and work around problems together. Your husband hates laundry and won't do it. Okay he does dishes instead. If you have kids, it's okay to put your so first. A healthy marriage is better for kids in the long run than a mom or dad that waits on their kids hand and foot. Mutual hatred of the same things. We like the what the frick is wrong with those people. Hey, at least we're not like that mentality. I'm divorced but I feel this applies. When my husband and I were on the verge of divorce he tried to make me give up my cat. I told him I'd divorce him before I gave up my cat. He couldn't believe I'd choose my cat over him. My cat didn't sleep with another woman while I was pregnant. He packed up and left the next day. 3 lessons. 1. Don't marry someone if you choose your cat over them. 2. Don't marry someone who'd make you give up your cat. 3. If they cheat while you're dating, a wedding ring isn't magically going to make them loyal. I mean I hope this is not a real thing because I think I would choose my cat over anyone. Not because the cat is genuinely more important but because there is no legitimate reason why anyone would need to make me give up my cat and therefore anyone who tries is a butthole and my cat is better than them even though he's a butthole too. It's not you versus them. It's you two versus the problem. Saying something before it becomes a problem. Putting your spouse before your children. Seriously. Figure out what's a big deal and what's a little deal, or irritation. Let the small stuff go. Every. Time. It's almost all small stuff. You'll rarely get upset at each other after you both master it. Respecting their personal space. Completely know the person for a long time before getting married. Less of a rule and more of a tip for young couples. There are two apps that have been critical to my happy marriage. Together almost 11 years, married for 7, a shared Google Calendar and a grocery list app called Our Groceries that lets you add things to the list. No more what do you mean we have plans this weekend. I just said we could do this other thing. No more hey I'm at the store right this minute what do we need texts. I can't speak for my wife, but for me, tolerance and acceptance. Most days, she loves me. Some other days, she hates me. I know it's not about me, it's about all of the other stresses in her life. Even on her worst day, I still say, I love you. How can I help? This is honestly key. My husband and I have been together 7 years and married 5. People always ask us how we're doing it so young and how we're so content in our relationship and my husband always says by tolerance and acceptance. My grandpa shared this advice with me. He's been married to my grandma for 67 years. When you feel like you're going to get into an argument, go into the bedroom, take all of your clothes off, and argue. You just might end up with more children than you anticipated. Mutual respect and amusement. Both of you should respect each other and find each other's flaws and foibles amusing. Everything else just comes down to putting in the work. And it doesn't have to be hard work all the time either, sometimes it's just putting in the time. My wife adds, assume good intentions. Your partner loves you, he's no trying to be inconsiderate, thoughtless, 
or a dong and she's not trying to be a bee or a nag. 1. Never use the D word, divorce, unless you're really prepared to go there. 2. Laugh, like a lot. 3. Learn to know when you fricked up and genuinely apologize, without using the word but. 4. Date nights, always make time for date nights. 5. Pick your battles wisely. 6. Get a dog, it's fun to obsess equally over something insanely sweet and adorable. If she stops nagging, that's when the problem has transcended from small issue to big freaking problem. It means she's beginning to give up on you. Marriage is a lot like being in business together. You must do your part and make good on your half of the bargain. It is extremely arrogant to expect someone to love you unconditionally. Not saying it doesn't happen, but don't expect it. Don't get lazy. A marriage is work. Keep putting in an effort. There are inevitably going to be people who are better looking than your spouse. There may also be people better suited to be your partner than your spouse and if you hadn't met your spouse first, things could be different. But you made a commitment and it is your job to stick with it. Go on dates. Get an active hobby together. My husband and I run and play squash. Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Inside jokes are a must. Unless you want some genuine advice, don't tear your dirty laundry in public. Keep serious arguments private. And lastly never ever go to our relationships. Remember to work when listening. Imagine with empathy that what your partner is saying is true to the best of his her ability and share in the work to meet him her halfway. You need to change for your partner as much as they do for you. You are both growing. Grow together. Always make her come. Don't get lazy about it. Always making her come seems both lazy and disrespectful. You should sometimes just stand up and go over to her. Put all the restaurant's name in your area in a hat. Agree that you will decide where to eat based on the name you pull out of the hat. I gotta spin the wheel of choices up and put all the restaurants we frequent on it. I would just use that to answer when she asked what I want. Acknowledge anything that mildly annoys you immediately. And when you fight, fight fair. No name calling or bringing up crap from the past. Texting is for grocery lists and logistics only. No arguments or fighting of any kind of via text. None. If you have something contentious to say, you say it in person. A voice call may be used as a last resort, or if we are in different states or something. But when we are in the same city, every single argument or heavy duty discussion happens face to face. No exceptions. This has saved us so much drama compared to other couples we know. Particularly because I was a writer by trade, so when somebody is fighting with me in written form, I am not always trying to communicate, I am trying to win. Winning is not a smart married man strategy, understanding should be the goal. <laughs> Marriage requires strong cooperative game theory, it is about as far from zero sum as possible. <laughs> Friendship, if you treat your spouse as your best friend, or, even better, that person is your best friend. You won't be going to someone else with your problems. You will respect that person, be honest, and care very much for them. You won't be afraid to show your feelings, and the sexual relations are a large benefit, but not a necessity, to a healthy relationship with that person. There is no unspoken rule. A successful marriage requires you to speak, talk often, talk about your day, talk about the little annoyances that happen from cohabitation. It's the best way to stop them before they become big, and talk about the big things. Most of them can be solved, but they can never be solved by silence. Leave nothing unspoken, and say I love you a lot as well. It's a nice pick me up during the day. Unsolicited affection. And by affection I do not mean sexual advances. They each have their place. Counseling if you're struggling. You have been visited by the IT lizard. Upvote or experience bad internet for a month. Thanks for watching. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Or don't. Either way, have a great day you magnificent people.